Kia ora, I'm Ryan Bridge. Welcome to episode 10 of Bridge Talks Business with Milford. This week, oil. Like it or low that the world is heavily reliant on black gold to power our economies and get our goods to market. Today, war in the Middle East is driving prices up. We're asking Milford's Andrew Curtain how high, what about supply, and could this spike ignite another inflation story just as we are getting good news on that front? Before all of that, though, here are your top five business bits from the week that was. Coming in at number one, a double-double whammy. The Reserve Bank slashed half a percent off the OCR last week, showing confidence inflation is coming under control. Could they go another half a percent next month? Talk of interest rates remaining restrictive certainly opens the door to that one. Number two, that cut sent the Kiwi dollar lower, while the NZX50 share index rallied a couple of percent. All eyes now turning to quarter three inflation data. At number three, China's taking more stock steps to help its ailing property sector and wider economy with further measures announced over the weekend. So far short on detail but expected to be long on recovery. Number four, can the Fed cut hard and fast given the new US inflation data? It came in stronger than expected. The market is taking note. Bond yields up sharply over the last few weeks. And at number five, this week, investors will start to focus on the micro part of the US economy with quarterly earnings announced. Don't expect much in the way of guidance with that big US election looming less than a month away. The past few years have been a hard slog, let's be honest. We've all felt that, right? But just recently, we've been told, the Reserve Bank has told us, inflation is coming under control. We are getting inside the target range. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. And then, bam, commodity prices start increasing. Oil, copper, iron ore, all going up off the back of war in the Middle East and also a slowing economy in China. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our inflation targets? I'm delighted to have back on the podcast Andrew Curtain, who is a senior analyst at Milford. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks, Ryan. It's good to be back here. Good to see you. Uh, Just a note that this is intended as informational only and should not be considered as financial advice. So let's talk commodities. What exactly is going up or has been going up in the past sort of month? Uh, We've seen a really big rally in oil price. Uh, That's gone up about 17, 18% over the last sort of four weeks or so. And we've seen copper and iron ore rally by about 20% each. Now, what what we're seeing is stuff that's linked to... um, the Chinese economy is rallying, so stuff that's sort of more cyclically exposed and would perform better if the Chinese Chinese economy is stronger. And we're also seeing oil go up because oil's got a risk premium built into it related to the war in the, in the Middle East. The war in the Middle East has been going on for a year now. What's happened in the last month? Is it the escalation, obviously, the, 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 the connection with Iran? It's the escalation we've had. Obviously, Hezbollah's been dragged into the war. Um, Israel's been very aggressively sending missiles into, into Lebanon. But the the key thing is we've seen a retaliation from Iran um, to Israel where they sent through um, a bunch of missiles on the um, 1st of October. And a few of those missiles got through and actually landed on targets in Israel. Now, Israel came out and said very strongly, we're going to retaliate. And by retaliate, that could mean um, quite a broad spectrum of things. At, At one end, and the most concerning would be they decide to hit nuclear facilities where Iran is conducting research um, of enriching uranium and potentially being able to build a nuclear warhead, that would be the most sort of concerning attack. Then you could have an attack which would involve um, involve hitting oil infrastructure because Iran is um, one of the larger producers of oil in the world. It produces around about four four million barrels of oil a day, um, and it exports around about one and a half to two million barrels a day. Now, if it hit oil infrastructure, this would have a material impact on the world's oil supply and could cause oil price to go a lot higher. And then, lastly, there's some um, slightly let's say, less severe options, um, which would, which would um, in, um, involve, say, attacking military targets. And so while obviously this is still going to be war and it's still going to be aggressive, it's not going to directly him- impact sort of oil sites or nuclear facilities. Yeah, and obviously everything we're discussing has implications for human lives, et cetera, and, and uh, those notwithstanding, I'm really interested in what it's going to do to, to the price of oil, to, to commodities. So in some ways, from a financial perspective, from a global economy perspective, would it be best? 
better that that uh, they hit the uranium enrichment facilities as opposed to the oil infrastructure? Um, yeah, that's that's quite a difficult <laughs> question. Um, I'm I'm probably, probably I'm, I'm probably going to say hitting nuclear facility is just not a good thing <laughs> at all. Right? But who knows what will happen there? And, and and by the way, I think that's quite an unlikely and um, unlikely outcome. Uh, you know, President Biden has been extremely clear; he does not want. You know, attacks on, on nuclear sites. Um, so, and you know, Israel was quite reliant on support from the US. So they do not want to annoy the US. Um, you know, in terms of sort of economic outcomes, I guess attacks on oil is going to have some sort of economic impact. If we get a situation where, for example, Israel, um, Iran is unable to export um, that one and a half to two million barrels a day, now that's about two percent of the world's oil supply. Doesn't sound like much, no, but doesn't. a two percent reduction could cause oil prices jump probably another fifteen. $20 from here. So, yeah, we've seen oil already go from about $70 to, to $80. So it's retraced a little bit now, but maybe we see oil go to $90 or, or $100. And, you yeah, know, it doesn't sound like a huge amount, but that's a 30% increase. And that's going to flow through to all the costs for transportation. Oil is used in a lot of production and manufacturing facilities and all that. So it does sort of slow down the economy a little bit, but it might just be temporarily. So we don't need to be too worried about it just yet. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look at what it means, what it could mean for our economy in just a second. But, you know, 100 bucks, maybe a little over $100 a barrel. It got up to, what, 120 at the worst? 120. Yeah, 120 was when the Ukraine war broke out. Um, that was, you know, partly was was because um, Russia exports around about, or produces about 8 to 10 million barrels of oil a day. So it's a huge oil producing nation. And the concern was that all that oil was going to get trapped in Russia and That's sanctions right. and was it going to come out. What's ended up happening is the sanctions got put in place, but Russia's got other friends like China and, yeah. and all the oil Bombing just goes out to chip. China. So exactly. So it's been coming into the market anyway. But we're also in a highly inflationary economy then. You know, the economy wasn't quite working right. Prices were going high. So you sort of had a perfect storm. So yeah, to put that in context. I mean, we're talking about oil at $75 today. It was at 80 just a few days ago. I mean, this is still a lot lower than $120 yeah. where it was, but it's also a lot higher than the $60, $55 level we got used to sort of over much of the last last decade. Um, and just, I guess the final point I sort of mention is, look, let's say we do get a situation where it goes to $100. Yes, that's causes some temporary pain, but we've got to remember that OPEC, so this is the oil um, group of oil mm -hmm. nations such as Saudi, Iraq, actually Iran's actually part of OPEC. They have around about 6 million barrels of capacity spare at the moment. Yeah. So if oil goes to $100, the okay. Saudis are going yeah, to decide to turn the taps on. And that's why I said the disruption could be a little bit temporary. We might see it go high for a bit and then come down next year as they turn the taps on. How much, I mean, we mentioned iron ore, we mentioned copper and oil, the commodities and China. So China's yeah. obviously been slowing down a bit from, mm -hmm. you know, seven, eight percent down to five, whatever it might be. Um, and in the last month, we've seen those those commodity prices come up as China's mm -hmm. sort of offered some stimulus to its economy. Um, how significant is that stimulus? Um, so we've had basically announcements coming from China every couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, the first first couple of announcements they made was more on what we call the monetary policy side of things. And that's basically saying we're trying to, well, basically the, the policy changes are around lowering interest rates. It's about lowering the central bank interest rate. It's about making it easier for banks to be able to lend money out. And that's called monetary, monetary policy. What we haven't seen too much of yet is fiscal stimulus. Mm -hmm. Now, fiscal stimulus is involved to government spending. Now, the reason the market wants to see fiscal stimulus is because that has a generally has quite a fast impact on demand for com commodities, demand for resources. Now, what what the Chinese government has said is we've, we've got some coming. They made an announcement over the weekend that there is going to be fiscal measures. They said they're going to help um, help bank, oh sorry, help um, local councils buy property, excess property that's sitting in the market. Um, they're going to um, have some subsidies come in for lower income consumers to help the consumer get spending. But they haven't announced exactly what they're going to be and how large they're going to be. Now, what the market needs to see is quite it's large fiscal... Yeah, well, they need large-scale fiscal stimulus to really get things going. So at the moment, moment we're, we're sort of at a point where maybe we're sort of, sort of stopping the pain a little bit in China. The, down, the downwards curve is maybe starting to bottom out, but we're not seeing enough to say, look, things are really going to pick up in China. What's holding them back? Because after the GFC, they just went hell for leather, right? And, and almost resuscitated the global economy through their efforts. So w what is holding them back this time? It's, it's in, in some sense, they're maturing as a nation. They're becoming, you know, they're going from a point where you used to have very cheap labour, um, the whole, the whole 
the whole point was trying to get them building things and getting the manufacturing sector going, building our infrastructure. And, and they did that, right? They, they became the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. They became um, one of the biggest property construction nations in the world, or the, the, the largest. Um, but the problem is they fueled a lot of that with debt. Mm. And so you've, you've now got this economy which has you know, grown at levels of sort of 7 to 8% for much of the last decade, but has fueled a lot of it by debt and now actually has a lot of overcapacity. They just built and built and built. And so when that overcapacity starts to come, come through, it starts to impact prices on the downside. So they start to get almost what's deflation rather than inflation. And because they're sitting in all this debt, it's, they don't really have too many options to get out of it. And this is sort of what's changed with the, the policymakers in China. They're trying to move their, let's say, their, their addiction to debt and leverage and, mm. and property cycle. They're trying to move that away and sort of broaden out to yeah, maybe what you see the US economy. And it's more sort of well-rounded and you've got technology sectors and other things that are driving the economy, but it's not an easy change. It's probably one of the uh, most difficult sort of challenges you could face as an economist or a policymaker to make this transition. Yeah, and, and especially as a, as a government in a single party state as well, which is a whole other issue. Right? <laughs> that's, ex that's exactly right. How is that of that volatility, let's call it volatility at the yeah. moment, because we don't have a lot of detail on what the stimulus might yeah. be, what shape it might, how are the markets reacting to it? You know, those, those proxies for China, the shares. Yeah, so... The market, let's yeah, the market was coming from a very low point. The negativity or the sentiment to China was China was probably the most negative it's been in the last couple of decades, and so it didn't need much to get things get a little spark to bring it to life, and um and it was a big shift from you know we're still lacking a little bit of the fiscal announcement, but it was a big shift, and so straight away anything that was exposed to sort of China manufacturing, China property, um, anything sort of Chinese consumer exposed has rallied quite significantly. So for a start, we're seeing Chinese. Um, the Chinese stock market rally over 35% in the space of about a month. So that's almost unprecedented in, in history, um, and but from a very low base. Mm. We've then seen, in, in terms of sort of outside of China, we've seen anything that's sort of linked to China rally quite significantly. So you know, um, BHP and, and Rio, which are the two big mining companies in the US, have rallied sort of 15 to 20% because iron ore prices and copper prices are going up, which they're big, big producers and sellers of. We've actually seen um, luxury luxury um, consumer names rally. So LVMH, which is the biggest luxury brand name in the, in the world, is rallied about 20% as well. And you sort of say, why is that? Well, Chinese are huge um, consumers of luxury and, mm. and their sort of weak consumer had been weighing on the share price of that. And then lastly, um, you know, you've seen some of the airline stocks, hotel stocks, ones that are sort of related to travel have been been rallying because, again, Chinese are big travellers. So, you know, that does have a sort of indirect benefit into New Zealand if you get the Chinese wanting to travel overseas again, helps us. So let's take a look. We've taken a look at the Middle East, the China situation, obviously a lot going on. What does it all mean for us down here in New Zealand? Yeah, so as as a whole, I'd, I'd say things are looking more positive. Um, you know, if we, if we start with China for a start, um, you know, that's our biggest exporting partner. We export about 30% of our goods to China. That means we are inherently quite linked to the performance or the success of the Chinese economy. So if the Chinese economy approves, that helps our exporters, you know, dairy, meat, poultry, um, all of that will be be supported. Um, the other thing is more of an, on an inbound. Um, we export tourism to China, which is Chinese um, consumers coming and spending money in New Zealand. Now, again, that's that should be helpful for us. Um, I guess the one thing to to, to temper it a little bit is, you know, the Middle East and, and the high oil prices. Yeah. So, you know, give or take, let's say, oil and oil link products are somewhere between sort of 5 6 7% of our, our CPI um, or our inflation measure. Mm. If you see oil prices really, you know, 20%, that, that has sort of a percent impact on our inflation numbers. So, you know, if oil price stayed 20% higher, all of a sudden inflation stops that nice decline we've been seeing over the last um, last 18 months and flattens off and goes goes a little bit higher potentially. If that happens, that's not as, that means the, you know, our reserve bank's a little bit more, or well, under a bit more pressure to, um, uh, sort of slow down the interest rate cuts. We'll yeah. And we like interest rate cuts. Yeah, they'll, keep, they'll keep yeah. them higher. For... But I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about that for now. I think, um, yeah, as we're seeing, oil price is really volatile. So okay. I think the RBNZ will wait and see what happens over a period of time. Okay. Do you think they'll go for a half a percent or a quarter of a percent or... <laughs> On the next one, I'm hoping for half a percent. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so, so and, and 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 because yeah, I think I think they likely will for the yeah. next one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you for breaking it all down for us. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ron. It's a senior analyst at Milford, Andrew Curtain, with us talking about oil, commodity prices, China. 
our big friend that hopefully will have a bit more fire in its belly going into the next couple of months, two years. That's it for Bridge Talks Business this week. We'll be back next week. See you then.